Listen, we are so excited about today's message. As we celebrate men, the message is called A Blueprint for Manhood. It's all about what does it look like to be a man? How do we live out this? How do you encourage the man in your life? Listen, you got to watch today. Especially for the fathers of fathers, happy Father's Day. Our tribute from Fred Hammond to you. We celebrate you and we thank God for you. Come on, family, let's stand together. I want to offer a word of prayer, and then we're going to dive into God's word on today. We are so thankful that you've chosen to worship with us. If you're a guest, this is your first or second time here, just wave your hand. All of our guests in the room, we want to tell you thank you so much for coming. We appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Would you catch your neighbor's hand? I want to offer a word of prayer before we dive into God's word today. Father, we come right now, and we just want to tell you thank you. Father, we come in this room, and as we were listening to those songs, it was like a soundtrack for every season we've seen in our lives. There were moments where certain songs spoke to certain situations, and we remember that late in the midnight hour, God, you will turn it around. We remember moments where it was played, that song, no weapon formed against us shall prosper. It won't work. So, Father, we want to thank you, Lord, for just how the songs and musics have been a melody to see us through so many seasons. We are grateful, Lord. Thank you for Fred and just his ministry and how it has blessed our hearts and our souls over the years and generations. And we thank you, Lord, for what we just experienced here today. Thank you for a chance just to praise your name and to celebrate your name and to worship your name. Lord, it's almost halfway through the year. When we consider everything you've seen us through, we can't help but to dance. We can't help but to shout. We can't help but to give you glory and to give you praise because we've seen how you've kept us. We've seen how you've provided for us. So, Father, we give you glory in this place. We honor your name. We praise your name because you are worthy. It is in the Lord, Lord, as we look to your word, Lord, may your word speak to your, our hearts and minds. Lord, I pray for the neighbor whose hand I'm holding even right now. I thank you, Lord, for their story, for their journey, for their highs, for their lows, for their valleys, for their mountaintops. And I pray even right now that you would meet them in this moment, that, that, that maybe they need peace. I speak peace over their lives. Maybe they need healing for them or someone they love. We speak healing right now. We speak, God, wisdom that they need, clarity that they need, direction that they need. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we thank you right now for what you're doing in my neighbor's life, for the hand that I hold. I speak blessing over their life even right now in the name of, Lord, we need you. We look to your word today. May your word show us and remind us all you are doing and are up to. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, we say this prayer. Amen, 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 amen. If you have your Bible, friends, I want you to open your Bibles with me as I want to share just a few words to encourage our men and encourage all of us on this Father's Day. 2 Kings chapter 18, 2 Kings chapter 18. I want to read a few verses from that particular passage on the day, 2 Kings chapter 18, beginning at verse 1 through verse 8. It says, Now it came to pass in the third year of Hoshea, the son of Elu, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abai, the daughter of Zechariah. And look at this. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all his father David had done. He removed the high places and broke the sacred pillars and cut down the wooden image and broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses has made. For until those days, the children of Israel burned incense to it and called it Neshatan. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor who were before him. For he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. And the Lord was with him. He prospered wherever he went. He rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. He subdued the Philistines as far as Gaza, as Gaza and its territory from Watchtower 
to fortified city. Amen. You may take your seat. Just tell your neighbor good morning if you haven't done so already or glad you came today. Amen. All right. Family, for a few moments today, I want to talk from this subject, a blueprint for being a man, a blueprint of a man, the blueprint of a man. The truth be told is that manhood is at a critical juncture. But there are so many challenges facing black boys and black men. From an educational perspective, black boys and black men have been falling, about for the, falling behind for the last few decades and outperformed by women at every level of education. For every two women that are in, in, enrolled in college and graduate from college, there's one man. When you go on to, to, to the professional schools, law school, medical school, and dental school, we find these same numbers. There's one man for every two black women that are there. When it comes to marriage and family, one out of every four young people live in a home without their biological step or adoptive father. And for the first time in history, marriage is on the decline and divorce has increased five times the last 30 years. There was a time when 95% of women would be married, but today at least 30% will remain single primarily because of the lack of marriageable black males. 64% of children, and we, we mentioned economically, black men represent the highest rates of unemployment or underemployment. The poverty rate of black children remains the highest in any race group. And then health-wise, there's been a rise among black boys and black men around suicide. It's the fastest current category in the country. And then when it comes to criminal justice, one in three black males born today can expect to spend some time in prison at some point doing his life. These are the realities that we face for black boys and black men, that there are unique challenges and difficulties that face us throughout life. But one of the challenges, one of the realities that can help us to manage through this is by helping us to understand what it really means to be a man. But for, for far too long, we've allowed the culture to try to define for us what manhood is. Like many of us, we've grown up thinking that a man was about how many women you could get or how much money that you have or what kind of job you had or what kind of car you drove. But we've discovered that all of those are empty when it comes to manhood. That the real definition of manhood cannot be found just by watching a video or watching somebody else, but it's found when we look in Scripture and we unpack what Scripture has to say about being a man. That's exactly what happens right here in 2 Kings chapter 18 as we look into the life of a man named Hezekiah. His, his, his life, Hezekiah, serves as a, as a picture, as a model of what it means to be a man. There are several things I want to lift up and then I'll take my seat. The first one is this, a man rejects passivity. A man rejects passive passivity means to be apathetic, unengaged, inactive, or in, unanswered. It means to have a whatever kind of attitude. And every single man struggles with this issue of passivity. And until a man decides to reject it, he can never be and become the man that God has called him to be. Passivity shows up the first time in Genesis chapter 3 when Eve, Adam and Eve are there in the garden. And the serpent comes up and offers Eve this fruit and then she gives it to Adam. But Adam never says a word. Adam never rejects the serpent as he comes, nor does Adam say, no, don't do it. Nor does Adam say, no, I'm not eating that fruit because God said not to. Adam was passive and just let everything happen. And this is the challenge that many of us face as men. This struggle with passivity because it's, it's, it's passivity will make a man let the woman take care of him and him not do anything. Passivity will allow a man to live with a woman, have children with the woman, but never marry the woman. Passivity will make a man blame everybody for his circumstances or his situation. Passivity will make a man half full of excuses, but not willing to activate the God-given strength that God has already put inside of him. Passivity will allow a man to live with his mother far longer than he ever should. 
Passivity will cause a man to get married but then expect the wife to mother him. Passivity will make us never be satisfied with one woman, but instead need multiple women. Passivity will make us know everything about our favorite sports team, but can't remember the anniversary of our, or the birthdays of our kid. Passivity will make me sit down and watch hours of football, but then never be able to date my wife. Passivity shows up in every man's life. It is passivity to make us sit still, but doesn't cause us to move forward. Every man has to wrestle with this inclination to stand still, not say anything, not do anything, but to settle and say, it'll be all right. But if you and I are going to be the men that God has called us to be, it starts foundationally when we reject passivity and we begin to move toward responsibility. Now, when you look in the text of the life of Hezekiah, Hezekiah is able to reject passivity. And some would say that perhaps it was because Hezekiah had a father in the home or a role model that showed him how to do it. But the truth be told, Hezekiah's father was King Ahaz, one of the worst kings that ever ruled. So for some way or another, Hezekiah decided, despite what I did see or what I didn't see, I'm going to take my life in a new direction and trust God and follow after God and reject what I've seen. And I want to celebrate every man in this room that you may not have had the father figure. Your father may not have been present, but look at you now. You've made up a mind. You've made up your mind what kind of man you're going to be. And you are walking in purpose. You are, the fa you are a better father than you ever could imagine because you've made up in your mind to take to reject passivity and move in a new direction. So I celebrate you, brother. I know you didn't see it, but neither did Hezekiah, but Hezekiah made up in his mind the kind of man he wanted to be. But I also want to say this, for some of you in the room, that's not your story. For some in the room, God blessed you with a man in your house that modeled what it meant to be a father, that, that invested in your life, was involved in your life, and you ought to praise God for just a couple of minutes for the men that God has put in your life. But every man wrestles right here rejecting passivity. But then moves, next, every man must accept responsibility. That, that the core idea, the core truth behind manhood is wrapped up in this ideal one of the initiative, taking a step, moving. But then secondly, around the ideal of responsibility. When you read the text, the text says it this way. It says, it says in verse 4, he removed the high places. He smashed the sacred stones. He cut down the Asherah poles. He broke apart the bronze snake. So when, when, when Hezekiah becomes king, there's all kinds of stuff going around that he didn't create, but it was there when he got there. Hezekiah comes in and he sees all these things, all these idols, all these monuments. And he says, wait a minute, we're, we're God's people. He says, how are we going to have worship to God over here and then worship to Baal and the God of the sun and the God of the moon and the God of fertility. He says these don't go together. He sees that the nation has been living with a foot in both worlds. They've been worshiping both at the same time. And Hezekiah says, I didn't put it here, but I'm going to change it because this is not who we are. All of us know what it's like to have a foot in both worlds. Oh, we know what it's like. We know what it's like sometimes to serve God on Sunday, but to do our dirt on Monday. We know what it's like to call on God on Sunday, but make booty calls, booty texts, and slide into DMs on Friday. We, we, we all know what it's like to, to, to claim and ask God to do it, but then put our own hands on our problems and try to fix it ourselves. He says, we, he, he says, a foot in both worlds. And when he sees this, he says, this is not who God has called his people to be. So what does he do? He starts tearing down stuff, cutting up stuff, smashing stuff. He, he says, he starts destroying all this stuff, all these idols that don't represent God. And I wonder in your own life, do you have any idols in your life that you need to tear down that you need to remove because they're going to hinder you from being who God has called you to be. 
I just want to encourage you today that today, perhaps it could be your demolition day. That today, today perhaps God brought you here today because there's some idols in your life that today he wants you to tear down. First of all, many men struggle with the idol of insecurity. Many men, we walk around not thinking we are good enough, not thinking we are smart enough, not thinking we're strong enough, not thinking we are up to the task. And so we mask our insecurity with all kinds of performance and I'm going to prove everybody wrong. I'm going to work hard and we, we, we spend our lives trying to prove that we are enough. And so this idol of insecurity makes us question, can we be the father or the man or can we be the husband or, or are we enough? And so we spend our lives trying to prove we're enough. But I want you to know, brother, today is the day when I want you to break that idol of insecurity and I want to remind you of who you are. Man, listen, you are God's son. You, you are God's servant. God has a plan for your life. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. God knows your past. God knows your present. And God knows your future. And God has a purpose for your life. You are able to be the man he's called you to be. You are able to be the husband and the father he's called you to be. You will succeed in your job because greater is he that's in you than heat us in the world. You are bigger than your past. You are bigger than who you used to be. You are bigger than whether your father was there or not. You are bigger than who hurt you. You are God's man and if any man be in Christ, he's a new man and God is doing new things in his life. You've time for you to break that out of insecurity. Stop doubting and questioning everything that's happened in your life. But walk in the power, in the confidence, in the, in the authority, and in the significance that God has for you. you got to break the idol of insecurity. But for some, it's not the idol of insecurity, brother, that's holding you back. For some men, it's the idol of pride that's holding you back. Can't nobody tell you nothing. I mean, you, you know everything. you got all the answers. You, you, can't nobody tell you nothing. You, you're real hard-headed. It has to be your way. And as a consequence of it having to be your way, your, your, your pride is short-circuiting what God wants to do. Because you always got to have it your way. You always got to be right. You always got to have all the answers. And you're never willing to ask for help. You, 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 just, you just keep pretending that everything's okay. One time I was at church and I talked to a brother. I said, hey, man, how, how your marriage doing? He said, oh, we're doing okay, man, doing okay. I talked to his wife uh, the, probably within the same couple of days. I said, hey, how y'all doing? Y'all doing okay? She said, no, he, he had, he, I put him out like a month ago. It's, it's <laughs> somebody lying. <laughs> somebody is not telling the truth. And it is this issue of some brothers to hide everything that hinders us from getting the help that we need. The doctor's told you to take your medicine and don't eat this and I need you to exercise and you ain't done nothing the doctor told you to do. This is, this is, this is, this is the pride that will short circuit what God wants to do in your life. The Bible says this, that God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Perhaps God brought you here today to break that idol of pride and to start being honest about where you are, to start being honest even where you, where you need help at because until you admit the need for help, you can't get the help that you need to move to where God wants you to be and to make and help you to become the man that God has planted inside of you. I, I, I've, been have, I've been in counsel in the past 15, 20 years or so. Off and on, off and on. I, I, got, a, I got an appointment this coming Thursday uh, that, I've, that I've, I've tried to be regular the last uh, seven, eight months because I need, I can't manage all this by myself. The, the mental weight of, of, of dealing with crisis and leading this church and my own family, my own kids, it will simply overwhelm me. And every time I try to press my way through stuff and try to deal with stuff, it, 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 something, always, something always pays the cost. So I sit down with somebody and I talk to them and I get to pay them to keep all my secrets. 
and we can, I can be as honest and truthful as I need to be and process stuff because I want to, I'm, I'm trying to, uh, see, here's what you got to understand. There, there ain't no perfect men nowhere. Ain't, ain't nobody perfect. There, a perfect man does not exist. Every single man has weaknesses and struggles and issues, and all of us are a work in progress, and God is trying to work on all of us, but God can't help a man that won't acknowledge that he needs help from somebody. Break the idol of pride. Here's the next. We got to break the idol of sex. Of, 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 of sex. Yeah, break the idol of sex. Uh, because many men, one of their greatest struggles is sex. Sex is that temptation that comes at us in so many different ways. And every man has to make some decisions in his life that I, that I got to figure out. I got to figure out a game plan for how I deal with the sexual temptation that every man faces. If you're not careful, you will spend your life chasing every woman in every situation. If you're not careful, pornography will continue to grow in our lives and rewire our brains. And we will continue to make sex something that we have to have and continue to treat women as though they are objects. Lamar Odom, a former NBA player, was being interviewed, and they asked him about some of his, his struggles with sexual, uh, um, sexual uh, appetite. And he said he had been with nearly 2,000 women. I mean, how many women do you need? Like, how many? At what point? At one point, at some point, you, we have to recognize the need in our lives to ask God to control some of the appetites and the issues that we all struggle with. Maybe God brought you here today because there's somebody in your phone you need to block or somebody in your phone you need to delete or maybe it's somebody in your feed that you need to block or maybe it's somebody in your feed that you need to unfollow. Maybe there are some relationships in your life and in your mix that God is saying to you as a man, maybe it's time for you to break this idol and rearrange some relationships and some friendships and some connections and my exposure so that I can honor God in this area of my life because all of us will be tempted. Maybe it's the idol of alcohol and drugs or Maybe it's the idol of bad company or immaturity. But here's the deal. Accept responsibility and begin your process of trying to find the wholeness and the healing that's only found in God. But friends, can I tell you what, brothers, and I want to tell you something. I, I, I already see so many of you accepting responsibility. And I want to celebrate you for the ways in which you've accepted responsibility. I, I, I know it hadn't been easy, but thank you and I celebrate you for accepting responsibility. I, I know those kids are not yours biologically, but you have leaned in to be the father figure and the present man in their lives. I celebrate you. I, I know you didn't have a father in your home, but look at you now. You are walking in this thing. I know it ain't being easy, but I celebrate you. I, I, I know that being a husband or being the man that you are has not been easy, but you've done the best you can to try to honor God in your home. I know you got some mistakes in your past, but look at you now. You are nowhere near the man you were five or ten years ago. I celebrate you. I celebrate you, single brother that's involved and in taking care of everybody else. I I celebrate you, man, that's not just taking care of your house, but your mother's house and your sister's house and your nieces and your nephew. I celebrate you working hard all day, coming home and still staying engaged and staying involved. I see you and I celebrate you. I celebrate you, man. So many good men in this room that are putting in the work and we praise God and celebrate who you are. Matter of fact, if when you see a good man or have a good man in your life, you ain't got to wait till Father's Day, but learn to celebrate and affirm and to cheer for them because when you cheer for them, you'll help them to keep running. So he must, he must reject passivity. He must accept responsibility. And here's the third one. He must lead courageously. Because their leadership and manhood are connected together. We know this because in Genesis 3, when God has given instructions to them. And when they break the commandment and God shows up, he doesn't say, Eve, where are you? He says, Adam, where are you at? He said, Adam, what, what happened? You had an assignment. You had one job, Adam, one job. 
And he says, Adam, what happened? Because there's a manhood and masculinity and leadership are connected together. That's why in Ephesians 5, he will say, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. He will say that husbands are the head as Christ is the head. But that, that ideal of headship does not mean domineering. That does not mean uh, abusive. It does not mean some toxic masculinity. No, he says, do it like Jesus did which is a servant and sacrificial love and leadership that when you love a woman right, she going to want to follow you. When you when you lead her well, she going to get right with you because she, she sees where God has taken the two of you. And so he says, this is what he calls us to do. He says, lead courageously. Every man needs a vision for his life and a vision for his family. That you, need, you need a vision for where you see God taking you and a vision for where you want your family to go. That you need to partner with your spouse or partner with a friend. So listen, this is what I'm asking God for. Five, 10, 20 years. Let's, let's seek the Lord together for what we are asking God to do. It means lead even from a vision perspective, but it also means lead her spiritually. Now, many of us know sometimes women can be more spiritual than men for whatever the reason. And so it, it doesn't mean that you got you to gotta compete with her on, 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 uh, on how many verses you got and, and, and what she knows about the Bible. But my one encouragement to you, my brother, is to pray for her. Just, just pray for her. If you don't, if you, don't you know, just pray for her and go to church with her and, and then and get involved. That's all you got to do. But just make it a habit to pray for her. And you've been saying, well, Pastor, you don't know I don't really do that prayer thing that well. All you got to do is say, Lord, I pray for my wife. That's it. You can pray one sentence, and that one sentence, God can move in her life in ways you can't even imagine. And sometimes when you're not talking to her and y'all kind of, you know, not on each other's best side, you, 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 you just pray for her by yourself and just pray for your wife and all that's on her plate and pray for the woman in your life. But praying for her is one way that you can love her spiritually, spiritually. Um, um, oh, here, here it is. Love her. Love her also securely. What's that mean? Do you know the number one question she has about her? The woman in your life wants to know, can she trust you? She wants to know, can she trust you? She wants to know that if she's not around, can she trust you on your job? Can she trust you um, at, at work? Can she trust you when you're not in your presence? She wants to know that when that woman walks by with a tight skirt on and, and you and both saw it, she wants to make sure, are your eyes going to stay with her? Or are you going to follow the woman all the way down the aisle talking about, I think I know her? You, you don't know her. No, you keep your eyes focused on your woman. You keep your eyes focused on your woman. She wants to know, can I trust him? Can I trust him with his messages? Can I trust him? Can I trust him? And the more you walk in integrity, the more you are helping her to trust you and to love you more. He leads his children. Y'all know this being present with our children matters. And he leads in his church and leads in his community. And lastly, he, he, he seeks a greater reward, God's reward. I'm done, but I just want to tell you that when you look at Hezekiah's life, when Hezekiah is able to trust God and follow after God, what we see is this pattern in Hezekiah's life where the text says, and God was with him. And every man needs to understand that God was with Hezekiah, God will be with you. And the only way you'll be able to handle the setbacks you face as a man, or the challenges you face as a man, or the obstacles you face as a man, and the only way that you'll be able to step and lean into the places and the purpose God has in your life is because God has been with you. And because he's with you, he helps you to deal with racism and discrimination. He, he helps you to deal with some challenges in the past. He helps you to deal with times when you've disappointed even your own self because we serve a God that doesn't give up on us, but he's the God of grace and the God of a second chance and a third chance. He helps us get to become who God has called us to be. And then I see Hezekiah's life is filled with the victories God has allowed him to have. When you read the rest of the story, you'll find out that God, that Hezekiah had some great challenges in his life, but God gave him victory over every single one of those challenges. And I know that's not just Hezekiah's story. I know that's also your story. That as a man, when you look back over your life, 
You've had your share of obstacles and challenges and difficulties and setbacks and mistakes and wins and losses. But now as you look back over your story, you can declare God has given you victory in so many ways. You are not the man you used to be. You're a new man because God is working and transforming in your life and you can give him glory and give him praise because God saw you through sickness. He saw you through singleness. He saw you through some tough times in your marriage. He saw you through some times as a dad when you didn't know what to do. But God is a God that can give you victory after victory to see you through. Amen. I need every man. I need every man to stand with me in this room. I need every man in the room to stand with me, please, in this room. As they stand, first of all, ladies, would you help me celebrate every brother in the room that you see? <laughs> I want you to know that I love you. I want you to know that I am incredibly proud of you. I want you to know that I see God's hand on your life. And it is a joy to watch where you were, where you are today but also what God is up to in your life. You have, you are here today because you understand your need for God in your life. You're here today because you know you can't do this on your own. And you understand that you're going to take other brothers shoulder to shoulder walking through this together. It also helps us to understand that when we have setbacks, we don't give up on each other, but we rescue and walk with one another till we get to where that man needs to be. So I celebrate each and every one of you on today because I believe in you and I hope you believe what God is up to into your life. That no matter what you, whatever season you may be, if you've been winning, I want you to know God has been the source of your winning. That God has been the one behind the scenes working and navigating. If you've been winning, I saw, if you've had some difficult seasons, don't let your difficulty make you doubt what God is up to. God is using it all. He's using every setback. He's using every no. He's using every failure. He's using every pain to make you a better man for him. I, I want to pray God's blessing over your life, man. I, I believe in you. I want to pray for you. If you don't mind finding one other brother or two other brothers, just catching hands. And I want to pray of you. I don't want no man left alone. Would you catch another brother's hand wherever you are? And I just want to pray over you. I just want to pray over you. I want to pray God's blessings on your life. I want to pray God's hand upon your life. I want you to, I want to pray over you. Sisters, if you're in the room, feel free to extend your hands and cover the men that are in this room wherever you are. Or sisters, you can pray for the men in your life that may not be here, but pray for them as well. Father, we come to your name right now. And Father, I pray over every man in this room. I thank you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. I thank you for every story that's represented in this room. I thank you, Lord, for every man and what you're doing in his life. I pray right now, Lord, for any setbacks he's facing. I pray right now for any challenges he's up against. I pray right now for any mistakes. I pray right now for any ways in which he doesn't and feel that he's who he needs to be. So, Father, right now I pray and I remind you of who he is. I thank you, God, that he is your servant. I thank you, God, that he is fearfully and wonderfully made. I thank you, God, that you have your hand on his life. I thank you, God, that you are working in his life. And I pray right now in the name of God, if there's any idols that needs to be broken, give him power right now to break them. I I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you may help him to be the man he needs to be in his singleness or in his relationship. I pray right now God that you would send him whatever he needs in his life. Send him the friends that he needs. Send him the relationships that he needs. I pray for him as an uncle, as a, as a father, as a husband. I pray right now God give him what he needs to follow after you. I pray God that you will give him a love for you and a passion for you and a commitment to you. I pray right now, God, that he will rush to talk to you every single day. I pray right now, 
of God. Eyes have not seen, nor ears declared what's in store for him. I pray, Lord, for the pain he may be carrying right now. Lord, would you minister to him? Would you bring healing to him? Transformation to him? Redemption to him? Restoration to him? Lord, we put every man in your hands right now. Every son in your hand right now. Every nephew in your hands right now. Every uncle, every father, every grandfather. We put them in your hands right now, Lord. Lord, have your way. Lord, we thank you in advance for what you've already done. Thank you, Lord, for the victories you've already given us. And we celebrate there are even more to come. It's in Jesus' name that we say this prayer. And all who agreed said amen. Can you give God praise in advance? Give that brother a word of encouragement. Give that brother a word of encouragement. Come on, 